What questions do people have about the connection between Darwinism and racism? This is John West, Vice President of Discovery Institute. Today, we are joined by historian Richard Weichart, author of a new book just released that is titled Darwinian Racism, How Darwinism Influenced Hitler, Nazism, and White Nationalism. Dr. Weichart is going to answer questions that have been submitted during a live webinar from hundreds of people around the world relating to the topics of his book. You can find out more about Dr. Weichert's book at darwinianracism.org, and you can purchase it at amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and other online booksellers. Dr. Weichert is Emeritus Professor of History at California State University Stanislaus and the author of multiple books on the intellectual history surrounding Nazism. Dr. Weichert, Richard, thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Now, we have lots of interesting questions, so let's get started. Um, one family who actually is homeschooling their, their son, they wonder if any of the many academics who promoted these views in Nazi Germany of sort of Darwinian racism ever stood trial for their role in promoting Nazism and its promotion of genocide. Well, there weren't any that were... Uh prosecuted just for their ideology, just for promoting different, their ideological perspectives. Uh, and in fact, a lot of, after World War II, a lot of people, uh, academics especially, were able to uh, basically uh, hide their uh, views to some degree to, to avoid uh, persecution by the denazification panels. However, uh, there were some people, of course, who were involved in the atrocities directly, di directly in the killing. Uh, and one person, per just as one example, was Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician. Uh, Karl Brandt was completely uh, convinced uh, that the ki killing of people with disabilities was a good thing, that it was promoting the well-being of society. Uh, and and uh, he had absolutely no... Uh, qualms about it, uh, even as he was put on trial, he believed that what he was doing was right. Uh, so uh, there are many uh, Nazi figures that were completely unrepentant. If we think about the people like uh, people like maybe Eugen Fischer, who was a, one of the leading anthropologists in Germany, or people like him, most of them escaped any kind of uh, serious ramifications. There were some people that were removed from professorships uh, as a result of their uh, pro-Nazi uh, policies, but that's probably about as far as it went for most of them, unless they were directly involved in the killing. Okay. Um, this question is from someone who says, regarding the Nazi leadership, do you think they actively thought about Darwinism and its implications, or did they just passively absorb it without really thinking about it? Was it part of their conversation, their strategy? And we're going to actually uh, join this with another question where someone was asking, they've always been curious if we know something about the training, for example, of SS officers, uh, those most likely to be in the midst of the extermination activities, to what degree was Darwinian thinking a formal part of their training? And so, so w were they trained that? And then were they just passive? Uh, or did they actively believe it? Those are the sorts of questions that we have a few people asking. Yeah, interestingly, that I, I really that's that second question is really uh, interesting because in my book, in the chapter on Nazi propaganda, I have a, a short section on an SS pamphlet that was used to train the SS uh, in their worldview, uh, and it's divided up into class sections. So this was used like in a, 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 a ideological training, you know, for SS and not, not just SS, it says SS and, and police forces. Uh, but there is actually an entire class period on Darwinian evolution. So it was taught very forthrightly uh, to the SS. Uh, and they did make very clear the connections with uh, the evolution of races and the racial struggle uh, and such. Uh, and that's not the only one. There's also another uh, pamphlet also that was uh, used by the, the SS and the Nazis for ide ideological indoctrination of army, off, of army personnel and such, too, that has very overt Darwinian uh, things. So this was something that they were uh, very 
forthright about. Uh, it's not something that's hidden. And that's, again, why it's so remarkable that people make these ridiculous claims that the, the Nazis were creationists. They were outright claiming uh, that they were using biological evolution uh, for these things. If you look at Hitler himself, in his monologues, Hitler discusses biological evolution. He doesn't use Darwin's name specifically, but he talks about biological evolution. In fact, there's one dialogue of his, I think it was Octo in October 1941, I could have that date slightly off, but where he was uh, talked extensively about how when he was in, in school, he'd been taught biological evolution in his biology, in his science class, and then he was taught creation in his religion class. Uh, and he talked about how the, the difference between those being taught those two things. And it's very clear that he claimed that he was siding with uh, the biological evolution uh, side and uh, promoting that uh, particular idea. So yeah, these are very, uh, they may not have always used the term Darwinism or Darwin, but they very often use the term biological evolution. They very often use the term uh, struggle for existence, which in German is Kampfungsdasein or Daseinskampf. They use that term quite frequently. Uh, they use terms racial struggle. And by that, they meant the racial struggle for existence. They use terms like selection, quite often natural selection, and also sometimes they just shorten it to selection. Uh, so they were using these terms constantly uh, in their uh, propaganda, in their dialogues and such. Okay. Um, this person asks, uh, how would the Nazis or Darwin himself view Whoopi Goldberg, which um, is an interesting uh, thing. Of course, uh, Whoopi Goldberg was noted for the comments about that uh, she didn't think that the, the Nazis ideas thought they were evil, but that they didn't involve racism. And so someone wants to know, um, uh, you know, how would the Nazis or Darwin himself view Whoopi Goldberg? Well, both Darwin and the Nazis would have viewed her as biologically inferior because of her race, yeah. quite simply. Yeah. Um, now, this uh, person asked a question, which I think is, is really, I've, I've seen it a lot, and so I'm, I'm glad this was raised. I have read and seen some who will grant that Hitler used Darwinian ideas to justify his actions, but that this was simply, this was an abuse of Darwinism, a twisting of those ideas to serve his own purposes. And they'll point out that Christians will do something similar with the Crusades. Is this a fair defense or is there something about Darwinian ideas that devalues human life necessarily? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, first of all, it's important to understand that uh, when Hitler and other Nazis were appropriating uh, these ideas, uh, they were not making them up themselves. They were taking over ideas that were already being propagated by Darwinian biologists. Again, it's, it's the scientists. It, it, these were not some fringe publicists that were creating these ideas about living space and about a racial struggle for existence. Uh, these were Darwinian biologists that were creating uh, these kinds of ideas. So if it was indeed a misinterpretation of Darwinism, it was a misinterpretation that Darwinian biologists were themselves promoting uh, during this time. So yes, uh, of course, Darwinian biologists today are not going to agree uh, with this way of racism. So they're going to say, no, it's a misinterpretation of Darwinism. Uh, and yes, they can argue uh, about that. But, by, but what I would say to them too, by the way, is that if they are arguing that these things are misinterpretations of Darwinism, they're not arguing with me and my historical uh, interpretation. What they're doing is they're arguing with the Nazis, and they're arguing with those Darwinian biologists of the late 19th and early 20th century that were embracing those ideas, and they're arguing with the white nationalists around today who are still embracing those ideas. Now, of course, you can embrace Darwinism and not embrace racism, and there are plenty of Darwinists around today who are not racist. We're not trying to say that you know everyone who embraces Darwinism is a racist. That's not the point. Uh, but there is a certain logic to it uh, that uh, they're going to have to you know, find uh, reasoning to get around because there's a certain logic to when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, his first two chapters, he didn't, by the way, he didn't talk much about human evolution in that book. He barely mentions humans right at the end of the book. But his first two chapters are on variation. The first chapter is on variation under domestication. The second chapter is on variation in nature. And so for Darwin to make evolution plausible, he had to show that there was significant variations within species. And so when he turned his attention in the descent of man to humans, he had to try to show to convince his contemporaries that humans had evolved, 
he had to try to show that there was as much variation as possible so that some people are closer to you know the brute beasts than others and others are uh, more intellectually superior and so by doing that way hitler uh, darwin was going to claim that the uh, human races were subspecies that's the term he uses for them so he thought there was even though he thought they're all part of one species he says there's lots of commonalities there's lots of things the same similarities but he still saw them as being subspecies and having some key differences and then in germany a lot of the Darwinists were even more intensely racist than Darwin himself, Ernst Haeckel in particular, who actually claimed that there are 10 different human species. He divided the races. He saw 10 different races that he thought were 10 different, completely different, uh, different species. And he even, even thought that those were different, that there were four different genera that those species were part of. So he really divided uh, things up. But these are Darwinian biologists doing this. Uh, so this is not some fringe wacko publicists you know, that we're framing these uh, kinds of ideas. Um, yes, I, I think that's a really good point. We're going to ask a few more questions relating to the Nazis in history, and then we have some questions from people that sort of tie into more today that we'll, we'll get to, um, and then some particular questions about your book, which I want to get to. So uh, now this comes actually from from a doctor who says Lipton's text Nazi doctors is quite informative of the mindset in the concentration death camps. What evidence is there that Darwinism was a prevailing notion among doctors, not just some, not just a doctor like Mengele, but more widely among doctors? Well, that's going to be tr tricky in a, a couple of levels here. For one thing, there was lots of Jewish doctors in Germany in the pre-Nazi period. Of course, many of them were going to be forced out of their positions. So you have large numbers of Jewish doctors who obviously are not going to agree with uh, Nazi uh, policies and relating to race, even though a lot of the Jewish doctors may have believed in Darwinism, too. Uh, and actually, there were a lot of Jews, uh, not just in Germany, but elsewhere, too, who embraced eugenics as well, uh, who embraced uh, Darwinism. Uh, so, but... Um, there, among the physicians in Germany, you're also there. Also, were in the Catholic parts of Germany more that were opposed to eugenics and sterilization and uh, perhaps racism as well uh, during that time too. So, I, I think we need to be careful that we don't sort of lump all the people into one thing. But the Nazis did have lots of physicians that were cooperative uh, with them as well. And there's been a lot of scholarship that's been done by. Uh, by historians looking at the way that, and not just Lifton's book, Lifton's actually a psychiatrist, but there's been a lot of work that's been done by uh, on the eugenics programs in Germany, on uh, uh, Karl Brandt himself. There's a good biography on Karl Brandt. Uh, there's a lot of work about not, and a lot of work on the euthanasia program as well. And the work in the euthanasia program shows that the Nazis did not have any difficulty finding uh, physicians who were willing to help them uh, with their euthanasia program. And even though a lot of them may not have been uh, writing things that were public, that were drawing the connections between Darwinism and the euthanasia program, uh, some did. And those that did embrace the euthanasia program very often did have this same kind of Darwinian basis of devaluing human life as a result of their views of Darwinian evolution. Okay. Yeah. You have a couple historical questions relating specifically to Darwin himself. Uh, one asking, basically, is, is there any evidence that Darwin himself had racist views? Okay. Uh, in, in, yes. In fact, I just I was just reading a book today that was published last year on the 150th anniversary of Descent of Man. And the uh, person who wrote that, Augustin Fuentes, wrote an essay in there. He's an anthropologist. I think he's at, no, they're not safe because I'm not exactly sure, mm. I, but in an Ivy League school in any case. Uh, he's a prominent anthropologist, and he had a little section in his essay on was Darwin a racist, and yeah, he said, well, yeah, he was a racist. You know, That's pretty well understood by historians that Darwin was a racist. Uh, some people will just excuse him by saying, well, just about all Victorians were racists, which isn't exactly true. And I talk about this briefly in my book. Uh, David Livingston, for example, was uh, a British living contemporary of Darwin's. Uh, he was a missionary and physician who went to Africa uh, and he was living among black Africans and was well or very well loved by the black Africans uh, because he loved them and he was not racist. Uh, so there were and there were also examples of secular individuals, too, like John Stuart Mill and others who were not 
uh, racist. So not everyone was racist during the Victorian period, but it, it is true that most people were uh, in Victorian England. So that's how they'll sort of excuse that. But what I find most interesting about Darwin's view is that Darwin is not only justifying and, you know, trying to corroborate his theory using evidence, the evidence of racism, which he sees as helping to support his theory. But he's also uh, putting forth the idea that these races are locked in a dark, in a struggle for existence. Uh, and this means, and when he frames this and talks about examples of it, he has actually a section in chapter seven of the descent of man. He has a, a, a section which is called the extinction of races. And in that chapter, in that section of that chapter, he gives examples of Europeans exterminating other peoples, indigenous peoples, uh, as showing that the Darwinian struggle for existence is going on. And so it's clear from that, as well as from some of his correspondence, uh, that Darwin thought that the uh, imperialism, uh, European imperialism, British in particular, uh, was a progressive force that was making the world a better place, even though it was being carried out by genocide. And he recognizes by killing off the peoples. It's not by elevating the peoples there. It's by killing them off. Mm. Wow. So uh, we have another historical question about which I, I hear all the time um, asking, wasn't it uh, Herbert Spencer responsible for the phrase survival of the fittest? And if so, did he advance an extension of Darwin's thoughts beyond Darwin or what, you know, what was the connection there? Yeah, Herbert Spencer uh, promoted ideas that uh, is sort of uh, social Darwinism avant la lettre, which means before the time. Yeah, yeah. He was promoting ideas about competition and such before Darwin's theory uh, came about. And he did propose the phrase survival of the fittest uh, and actually wrote that in a letter to Darwin. And Darwin did acknowledge that that phrase was apt. And Darwin did use that phrase later after that. So it's not just a misconstrual of the of Darwinism to use the term survival of the fittest. Darwin himself did not see that as a uh, mistaken uh, way of uh, phrasing uh, it. Uh, Spencer uh, was much more radical than Darwin in writing about social themes. And so he wrote extensively about uh, econo laissez-faire uh, economic competition and such more than Darwin did, uh, certainly publicly. Uh, and so there's a sense in which, yeah, Spencer was a little bit more radical in his social Darwinism, at least I mean, publicizing his social Darwinism. But if you look at Darwin's own writings, Darwin also was a social Darwinist. He did apply his theories to uh, society. He writes, for example, in, uh, I'm pretty sure this is in Descent of Man, he says that primogenitor, which was the idea of the, the first, the eldest son inheriting the entire property of the nobility, he said he thought that was a bad idea because it lessened competition. Uh, and, it, and the person who's the eldest may not be the fittest, you know, and so he had these ways that he, he was trying to apply Darwinism to social policy and such too. And then there's a, a letter that I actually sort of rediscovered uh, back in the 1990s when I was doing my dissertation work, uh, and I published it in the History of Science uh, journal ISIS, where Darwin said that he thought that uh, trade unions and cooperatives were a bad idea because they diminished competition. Uh, so this had, again, had to do with this competitive ethos that he thought this natural selection was a good thing as drive bringing progress. Uh, and so uh, he was wanting to see that come about. Okay, great. So we have uh, a lot of questions about applications for today. You've already actually touched on some of that, but I just want a couple of questions asked do you see this use of Darwin being used today, where and how? And then someone asked more particularly, do you see Darwinian ethics used today? Okay. Uh, and the first one about the Darwinian racism being used today. Again, if you look on the white nationalist websites and, you know, thankfully I do still think they are a fringe group, but they're a very vocal fringe group. Uh, and so you do find that on white nationalist websites and uh, in their uh propaganda uh, that they put out. And that's what my last chapter uh, details some of. In terms of the Darwinian ethics, now that's a trickier kind of question because there's all sorts of different ways that Darwinian ethics gets uh, promoted today. Uh, there, we have evolutionary psychology around today, uh, and but the notion of evolutionary ethics is quite, uh, is featured by some people under that term, uh, 
Uh, today, I've been to conferences on evolutionary ethics uh, where people are promoting uh, the notions of evolutionary ethics, which really has two kinds of ideas contained in it. One is that ethics have evolved. That's one kind of idea about evolutionary ethics, that ethics have evolved through evolutionary processes. Uh, and so that's what morality is all about. And Darwin believed that, by the way, in his uh, Descent of Man, he talks about the evolution of morality. Uh, and then the other idea about evolutionary ethics, though, and, and uh, by the way, you can don't have to, you can believe both of these or just one. Uh, the second idea is that what promotes uh, evolutionary progress is what is morally good. And that's a second kind of way of framing evolutionary ethics. And that's where the eugenics movement, of course, was going to was going to embrace that. And you get people today embracing both of those ideas. In fact, uh, it seems to me that the notion that ethics and morality have evolved is actually a fairly mainstream, a fairly widespread idea among biologists. Uh, uh, E.O. Wilson with his sociobiology, which came out in the 1970s, was going to promote that idea very strongly. Steven Pinker with his evolutionary psychology promotes that idea very strongly, that, that ethics and morality is just an evolved trait. Uh, and so that idea is fairly mainstream. The, the second idea that what promotes evolution is uh, morally good is not quite as widespread, I don't think, in scientific circles. But you get things like the transhumanist movement, which is promoting that kind of idea as well. So it's out there as well, and also in some academic circles. Okay. So we're, we're running out of uh, our time. So want to, we're going to need to wrap up in just a moment. But I, someone actually asked a really interesting question relating to the American experience. I know your focus is on Germany, but they wonder, uh, we had a couple questions on this, about the impact of Darwin's theory on racism and concepts in America in the 20th century. And you've talked about it today with sort of the, the neo-Nazis and right wing, uh, alt-right, so, so-called alt-right. But someone asked, wonder if you are aware of a speech given by Charles Francis Adams Jr. in which he felt that in the Civil War, the North was right in fighting for Black equality until he read Darwin. That led him to believe the mm. South and slavery were correct. And then someone else asked, you know, in the 20th century, what were these Darwinian ideas impacting American views? And I don't know if you can speak to that, but I thought since we had a couple questions, I would give you the yeah. chance. Yeah, I can hit it to some degree. Uh, again, I'm not as expert on those on the American scene, but I do know quite well that scientific racism was very widespread on the American scene, especially in the 1890s and first couple of decades of the, the 20th century. Now, it was going to wane in the 1920s and 1930s, especially under the influence of uh, Franz Boas and his anthropological school. Uh, and by the way, if you read Alt-Right uh, alt and the uh, white nationalist websites today, Franz Boas is one of the most hated figures <laughs> by them because of his bringing about of ideas about cultural determinism uh, and environmental determinism into anthropology apology rather than biological determinism, which had been reigned supreme before uh, Boaz uh, came on the scene. Uh, but there was a good deal of scientific racism. If you look at, uh, I think some people might be familiar with the Scopes trial, the, the Hunter textbook that was used there was promoting scientific racism. I mean, that was a, it was a textbook thing, you know, as school kids were being taught that this is scientific, uh, that these people are of different races. And it, this was definitely including that black Africans as being part of the inferior uh, races. Uh, uh, and it was also affecting immigration policy in the United States. Uh, John West, uh, you'd mentioned earlier about the mm. Eastern Europeans. Uh, yeah, uh, the there was this was uh, impacting immigration policies of not wanting other races, including Eastern and Southern Europeans, mm. to come into the United States in as large of numbers uh, because of scientific racism. So scientific racism had a very profound impact in the United States. And that's one of the things that I hope people will think about, too, in, in reading this book, even though I don't talk about the United States. The, the really, there's really this untold story to some degree of scientific racism. Not that it's completely untold. There are some scholars no. who have uh, dealt with it. Uh, but when you look at this issue of racism and look at the books that are coming out today about racism, I just looked uh, recently at some of the most recent scholarship coming out about racism uh, when I was getting ready for you know uh, this book coming out and everything. And uh, the a lot, what a lot of them, what I found was a lot of the books being published by scholars today about racism are about evangelical Christianity and its contribution to racism. You don't find things about the scientists and their contribution to racism. 
Now, I'm not trying to give evangelical Christianity a pass. There was a lot of horrible racism that was being put forward by people who called themselves evangelical Christians uh, in the uh, mid 20s, in the early 20th century. But what's interesting uh, is that if you look at the way that uh, the sort of the people who are on the forefront of racist uh, agitation and pushing for racism, if you look at what was happening there, uh, there's some good scholarship that has shown that in the middle of the 20th century, there was a key turning point. I mean, you have things in the early 20th century, like the Ku Klux Klan, which did have this sort of Christian identity or claim to have a Christian identity and such. But in the last half of the 20th century, uh, the vast majority of people who consider themselves sort of hardcore racists, white nationalists and such uh, had a very secularized outlook. They were very often anti-Christian uh, and they were very often using Darwinism. Uh, and so they were using scientific racism, not religious conceptions of racism. So when people are trying to you know, combat racism today, uh, Yes, there are still vestiges of it in lots of elements of society, and we need to combat it wherever we find it. Uh, but the biggest uh, uh, and most vocal elements of white nationalism today are pushing a scientific racism based on Darwinism. Yeah. And I'd encourage people, it's not a book, but if people who are interested in the impact, particularly in the 20th century in America, uh, watch the documentary Human Zoos. It's about an hour long, and, and Dr. Weikart is a key part of it. And that tells just some of that story. And I would say even among the, the people who claim to be Christians, who, who twisted Christianity to promote racism, by the latter part of the 19th century, many of them were imbibing Darwinian justifications for that. Yeah. So it wasn't just that they were citing or misreading the Bible. In many cases, they were, but they were also being reinforced that, well, modern science actually shows it's right. So um, and very pernicious. And many of the people, who, of course, who were speaking out against it were both mm -hmm. black pastors, especially, but also uh, a number of white pastors uh, based on their belief that we were created in the image of God, especially the debate wow. over this African man who was put in a uh, in a monkey cage in uh, Mr. Odebenga in the Bronx right. Zoo. It was right. the clergy, yeah. both black and white, who criticized that as being dehumanizing. It was the New York Times, the uh, you know, leading professors at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, Columbia University, mm -hmm. others who poo pooed it, any criticism and justified it. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'll get off my, my soapbox <laughs> and say that there is one more question and then what we need to end. But who is your new book pitched at? Academics, lay people, general audience? I hope it's pitched at uh, all of those. Uh, I have written it in a way it is extensively footnoted so that academics can follow it. They can uh, check my sources. They can uh, uh, debate it and everything. But I've written it in a way that I think is intelligible to uh, lay people and, and uh, just about anyone uh, who has a high school education, I think, and maybe even high schoolers themselves uh, would be able to find it accessible. I hope so. So. I, I would agree with that. And someone else asked, well, um, they were so happy that this was at an affordable price because many of your academic books, if you don't set the prices for, are, are quite quite expensive. And I'd say yeah. this is, uh, you know, it's a new book, but it does conceptualize a lot of things you, you've said elsewhere and add to it and also defend against criticisms. And so in this one book, you, they can get a lot and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't cost $90 for it. To, so um, mm -hmm. it's a great book. Thank you for writing it. Um, yeah. The book is Darwinian Racism by historian Richard Weichart. You can find out more at darwinianracism.org and you can purchase it at amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com and other online booksellers. For ID the Future, thanks for listening.